HTTP is a communication protocol which provides abstraction on top of TCP protocol and it is very easy for developers to work with. One of the very first topics I talked about during my system design was HTTP protocol where we learned client and server communicate with each other over HTTP. So a client communicating with a server, they usually do over HTTP. Now when we think about this client-server communication over HTTP, we assume or expect this communication is private or secure. In other words, we would expect that any message sent from a client to server over HTTP or a server to client over HTTP would be private between them because they can be sharing sensitive information. However, this would be an incorrect assumption that their communication would be secured by default. A malicious actor who is well trained or who has access to correct tool can actually hijack this communication and may intercept the underlying IP packets that are being transferred between client and server. Meaning, the malicious actor can read or understand what client and server are talking about. Or in some cases, it can alter the communication between client and server. In any case, this is breach of privacy of security. A malicious actor or a third party intercepting the communication between two other parties that is expected to be private is also known as man in the middle attack. It is a well-known occurrence in the field of security. It is usually written by its acronym MITM attack or man in the middle attack. This is at the core what we are trying to solve with security. Now before moving forward a quick disclaimer. Unlike most of the other system design concepts like storage, load balancer, caching, it is almost certain that you are not required to know much about security. However, it is in your best interest to familiarize yourself with high-level understanding of security because system design interviews can go in many directions and it's quite likely that you might start to have a conversation with the interviews that leads to some topic on security. So, having a decent high-level understanding on the building blocks of security will help you to confidently design your system. Okay, so by now you are clear that when you got a client and server communication over HTTP, their communication is not secure. And most of you might have already guessed that we need HTTPS for the connection to be secure. But before jumping into HTTPS and how it works, we have to define or understand what is encryption. Because encryption is a key component to the secure aspect of HTTPS. Let's say a client is sending a simple message hello to the server. And it doesn't want anybody else except for the server to read that message. And so, we would somehow want to hide or obfuscate the message and that is where encryption comes into play. The idea behind encryption is you somehow encrypt the message meaning you turn it into a random string of characters or some form of data that is no longer legible and that the encrypted data should be able to be decrypted only by the particular party, in this case the server. So in this case, when the client sends hello, you encrypt it somehow into some random string that no one can understand. And then the server can decrypt that random string of characters and decrypting it would return an underlying message hello. There are two types of encryption, symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. Let's look at them at high level. Symmetric encryption is an old and best known technique. This is the simplest kind of encryption because it involves only one secret key to encrypt and decrypt information. You may think of a key as a secret like a password used to encrypt and decrypt information. Symmetric encryption uses a secret key that can be either a number, a word or a string of random letters. It is often blended with a plain text of message to change the content in a particular way. The sender and the recipient should know the secret key that is used to encrypt and decrypt all the messages. So imagine I got a key, say a string foobar, and then I use a special symmetric key algorithm using that key string foobar and the only way that data can be decrypted is using that key foobar. Generally, symmetric encryption uses AES or Advanced Encryption Standard, which is a specification and describes a symmetric key algorithm that relies on single key. One nice thing about symmetric algorithm is that it is very fast because it relies on just one key. And the main disadvantage of the symmetric encryption that is all parties involved, in our case the client and the server, have to exchange this key used to encrypt the data before they can decrypt it. This is usually fine when you want to communicate with a friend and you may just decide to share the key in person. But when it comes to client and server communication, how do the client and server establish a common key? That key has to be shared and in order to be shared, that key needs to be shared over security communications channel. Otherwise, you can still end up with MITM or man in the middle attack. Okay, so now let's talk about asymmetric encryption. 
Asymmetric encryption is a relatively new method. Compared to symmetric encryption, it uses two keys to encrypt information, a public key and a private key. A public key is made freely available to anyone who might want to send you a message. And the second private key is kept a secret so that you can only know. It is designed in such a way that a message that is encrypted using a public key can only be decrypted using a private key. While also, a message encrypted using a private key can be decrypted using a public key. As the name suggests, the security of the public key is not required because it is publicly available and can be passed over the internet. So in our case, if a server has the private key, it would be the only entity to decrypt the messages of the client. Asymmetric encryption basically eliminates the need to share the key by using a pair of public-private key, which is why it is mostly used in our day-to-day -day communications channels, especially over the internet. RSA and PKCS are one of the popular asymmetric key encryption algorithms out there. Now this all brings us back to HTTPS or how do we make HTTP secure? Because like I said, the S in HTTPS stands for secure. So here I'm going to walk you through something known as TLS handshake to understand how symmetric and asymmetric encryption come into play. And again, everything discussed here is at a high level, but at the same time, it will make sense in terms of system design interviews. Okay, so HTTPS is an extension of HTTP, which runs on top of TLS. TLS stands for Transport Layer Security Protocol. Basically, it's a security protocol, which is why sometimes you'll hear HTTPS referred to as HTTP on top of TLS. Or in other words, HTTPS communication is encrypted using TLS. And by the way, the predecessor protocol to TLS was called SSL, which stands for Secured Socket Layer. Today, we generally use SSL in the context of SSL certificates, which I'll discuss shortly. Okay, so let's go back to our client and server example. But this time, they are communicating over HTTPS. And we need to understand what happens here that makes the communication secure. In short, when the client and server establish a connection, they first go through TLS handshake. This TLS handshake process establishes a secure connection. So what happens during a TLS handshake? First thing that happens is the client sends to the server something called as client hello or see hello, which is just a random string of bytes that the client generates randomly. And then the server responds to the client with two things. First of all, it responds with a server hello or s hello. And just like client hello, it's just a random string of bytes generated by the server. In addition, it sends the client an SSL certificate. Now we'll get back into SSL certificate in a minute. For now, what you need to know is that in the SSL certificate, there is a public key, which is coming from the public private key pair the server has. So say the server has a private and public key here and the server's public key is contained in this SSL certificate, which is being sent to the client from the server hello. Now, once the client has the public key and using that, it generates another random string of bytes, which we are calling here the pre-master secret. So when sending this pre-master secret to the server, it, it will encrypt this using the public key that it got from the SSL certificate provided by the server. When the server gets this client encrypted pre-master key, it can decrypt it because only it has the corresponding private key portion of the public key. At this point, both the client and server have access to three things. They have access to client hello, the server hello, and the pre-master secret. And using these three things, they are going to generate the session keys, actually four session keys. But in our case, these details don't matter too much. What you need to understand is, using these three things, the client and servers are generating four session keys. You can simplify this and instead of calling for session key, you can say the client and server are generating a symmetric encryption key for the session. This symmetric key is only valid for the session. And when the session is closed, the key is discarded. And this is done when you connect to any secure website where your web browser is the client, which talks to the server of the website. At this point, there is still one thing we need to get clarity on, and that is SSL certificate. We saw that the SSL certificate has a public key. But then, why don't we call it just public key? Why call it SSL certificate? Well, if the server just sent a public key here in the beginning, it is still vulnerable to MITM attack. And a malicious actor can interpret that initial communication and modify the public key. So the client might end up having the public key of malicious actor and it will encrypt the pre-master secret using the public key of the malicious actor. The malicious actor can then be able to decrypt the pre-master secret 
and basically the entire communication channel is hacked at this point. The problem here is how the client knows the public key that comes from the server is off the server. In other words, how the client can trust the server who the server claims it is. This is where SSL certificates come into play. SSL certificates are granted by trusted third party called a certification authority or in short CA. A certification authority or CA is a trusted organization that verifies websites and other entities so that you know who you are communicating with online. The certification authority can be a non-profit or for-profit organizations such as Let's Encrypt or DigiCert. So if you type google.com in the browser, with few clicks, you would be able to see certificate authority. The certificate issued by the certification authority is a digital item. It contains the public key of the server. It also contains the name of the entity that owns this public key, that is the server name and some sort of assurance that I am a trusted third party and the certificate authority and I am assuring that this public key belongs to this server and this SSL certificates prove that this server is who they say they are. Now, this all information will be signed by the private key of the certificate authority itself and the client in order to verify this digital signature, the client will use the public key of the certificate authority. To clarify, we have talked about two public key private key pairs here. One public key private key pair is of the server we discussed earlier. Here we are talking about the public key private key pair of the certification authority itself. The certificate is signed by certification authority's private key and the fidelity of the certificate can be verified by the client or by any client just by using the public key of the certificate authority. And since the certificate authorities are well known trusted third parties, most browsers such as Google Chrome or Firefox that we use will already have the public key of all these trusted third-party certificate authority stored such that it can verify all the certificates the browser will be getting from various websites. So, when you type a URL on the server, if the site is not running on HTTPS, Chrome or any modern-day browser will flag that website as insecure. Since we have been talking about so many keys, things can get really complex. So here, I would like to reiterate the entire TLS handshake one last time. So let's begin. The client or your browser sends a message to the browser, client hello. The server responds with server hello, as well as its SSL certificate, which contains its public key, information about itself, and is digitally signed by the certification authority, using the certification authority's private key. Then. The client or browser verifies by decrypting the certificate using the corresponding public key of the certification authority. It then gets the public key of the server from the certificate. And because it was digitally signed by the certificate authority, it is now being assured that the certificate belongs to the server. The client then encrypts the pre-master secret using the public key of the server, sends it back to the server, and then the client and the server use the client hello, server hello, and the pre-master key to generate session keys, which will then be used to symmetrically encrypt any further communication between themselves. And once the connection ends, the session keys are discarded. They are only valid for the session, and any future connection will go through this entire process of TLS handshake. And this is how a client and server establish a secure connection over the network. And this is how HTTPS works and modern day systems handle security.